for all coming, and uh, it's good to be here again. I've been to Brighton once for this, and uh, it's good to see so many of you out. Can you all hear me, first of all? Yes. Okay, because I don't like microphones. I prefer just to talk directly. In the communities I work in in Vancouver, Canada, in the native world, before we hold a gathering, we uh, do something called the, word, the good words that precede all words. And in the native tradition, that is to acknowledge and give thanks. Uh, for each other and also our ancestors, the one who brought us here, and also the ones who can't be here. And I wanted to acknowledge them before we do anything with these two images that I've got up. This first one is a banner that we've taken all over the world. This was made by children in the downtown east side, mostly Aboriginal children, in memory of the children who died in the Indian boarding schools in Canada. And we've held this outside churches and inside churches. We held it several times outside the Vatican in Rome, outside Buckingham Palace, all over the world really, outside the Parliament buildings in Ottawa, Canada. And as part of that work, I began to meet all sorts of different people, including those in the, the Mohawk Confederacy. And this is a very important symbol. As a matter of fact, the last time I was in Mohawk territory near Montreal, uh, I was given this. It's called the Turo Wampum. And as people in England, it's very important you understand this history because it's the very first treaty that was ever established between the Mohawk Confederacy and the Crown of England in 1689. You see, when, when the English and the French first arrived in my part of the world, they needed the native people for military alliances and the fur trade and other things. And so they signed a treaty with them. And it was actually devised by the Mohawk. And this represents the two rivers of life down which the native people uh, go in their canoe and the Europeans come in their ship. And the idea that the symbol in the Rotu or Wampum was that the Europeans and the indigenous people were to go side by side down life together, not seeking to dominate one another. And so on the basis of that recognition, this treaty was signed. It was called the Tu Wampum Treaty. And it wasn't only about indigenous people, it was also to establish the way that settlers were to live in the New World not on the basis of being dominated by anybody, but on the basis of equality. So in effect, it was the first constitution in Canada. Now, the Crown of England abrogated this, um, and that's why the Mohawks gave this to me and actually um, authorized me to take this message out to my people, which is to say, we have always stood by the two or wampum, but the Europeans haven't. The Europeans violated this when they imposed their false jurisdiction on Canada, when they brought in the Indian Act, when they tried to wipe out the natives the native nations that had trusted them and invited them into their territory. So, it's, in a lot of this work for me, it's become more than what originally brought me into this, this work almost 20 years ago now. <coughs> and we can talk a little bit about that later, I hope, because as we often talk about in our circles in Vancouver and other places, wisdom is held in the group, not by an expert. And so I often look to all of you to, to contribute tonight <coughs> In order to relate this to our own lives, because, and I'll just end on this, that for me, very much now, the, the issue has to do with certain basic things that we all share, the survival and the safety of our children in the face of organized child trafficking and a whole history of assaults on children, which not just happened in boarding schools, but which, unfortunately, is a legacy uh, of not just European tradition, but certainly of Christendom in the New World and in other countries around the world and how those abuses and crimes continue to the day. And the survival of all of us on this planet together. So one of the things I've learned is that there's all sorts of narratives or stories in any one issue, and we hope to bring that out tonight. The main way I hope to bring it out is through this film. And this film was made almost four years ago now. And it was done on the basis of an experience I had bringing out these stories as I worked with Native people as a Protestant clergyman on the west coast of Canada. And the way we devised the film was to tell two stories, the story of a white minister and the story of the people he was meeting, to put a human face on this whole thing we call genocide. And I'll be happy to share more of that after, but the way we thought we'd do it tonight, because the film is two hours long and we wouldn't have time for discussion, we're going to have a natural break in the film at 40 minutes. And after those 40 minutes, we're going to open up for your comments and discussion, questions and everything. And we have copies of the film, we have copies of my books and the other work that we're doing here in England around the world. So we can be you know, sharing all of that after. So that's going to be the format. And um, 
I think uh, I'll just stop there and we'll just watch the film, which actually tells you more than I can right now. And after 40 minutes, then we'll open it up for, for all of you. Thank you. I think Australia, South Africa, and Canada are really similar. They're kind of like settler societies where the, this kind of colonial arrangement really hasn't ever changed. Um, but I know that um, I work, actually, I met a delegation of Aboriginal people from, uh, from Australia. And they were telling me stories that like, were identical to what you hear in the residential schools in Canada. So no, I don't think it was really that different. The thing about Canada that you get, and, and that this is one of the problems of getting this story out, is that the perception people have in the world of Canada is that this is wonderful, probably because of the contrast with America. And there's other people from my here too who can probably comment on this. But um, you know, in, in the whole idea with, that, that was propagated by the Crown is that um, under the protection of the Crown, Indians have it better. You know, they, they fled Custer and came up, and the great white mother Victoria protected her, her infant. Indians, you know, kind of like that attitude. The reality is very different. Um, the area where I live in Vancouver Island, um, and this is now being documented in some books, the Royal Navy used to go up and down in the 1860s when the white settlers were first coming in. The Royal Navy made a practice of bombarding all the Cowichan villages, just shelling them, destroying them. There was a, uh, the, um, and in my latest edition of Hidden from History, we document how there was a, an Anglican missionary called John Sheepshanks. And he went on to become, he was appointed Bishop of Norwich and ended up in the House of Lords until 1908. What Sheepshanks did is he went into the northern interior of British Columbia and he inoculated a lot of the Chilcote Indians with smallpox. Within about two to three months, 80% of them were dead. He was a partner in what's called the Puget Sound Land Company, owned by Hudson's Bay and all the government ministers and, and chief judge, they were all shareholders in this company. They had preempted the land in Canada, what you did, like in Australia, you go and build a fence or a tent anywhere, and it's yours. You preempt it, so you take it from the Indians that we. But you're not allowed to do that if there's living Indians on the land. Well, they were preempting this land before any of them died, knowing they were going to die off en masse. And then who gets all the land? Well, all the shareholders. And so that process was actually led by the missionaries. And um, you know, I, I tell audience in Canada about this, and they go, well, no. That's the Anglican Church. I mean, I've gone there since I was a kid. They, they wouldn't have killed off people deliberately, right? But, the, and what I need, you know, look, what we need to look at is the fact that European civilization is both, like any culture. It's the light and the darkness. Okay, yeah, it's, it's people wanting to do good in their, in their interpretation of what good is. But it's also this, this other side, which we can't look at as the people who did it. It's very, my wife Carol taught in Japan for six years. And she tried to talk to them about what Japan did in China during the 1930s. Nanking, Manchuria, all that. Not taught in the history books. It's as void in the history books as this is in Canada. And you've got to go outside your own culture to often learn these things. But I mean, it's the same thing we're dealing with. You know. Yeah. Yeah. How up to date is the Indian Act? That part of the Indian Act that we showed up, is that up to date now? Yeah, the latest, uh, the latest uh, revision was in 1986, but it hasn't been revised since then. And all of those provisions are still in place if you live on reserve in Canada. Uh, so it's kind of a, Native people are kind of blackmailed. If you want to get government assistance, you stay on reserve, but basically you're living on a, in a concentration camp. And um, if you live off reserve, which is what a lot of people do, you don't have access to a lot of the government funding in that. And as uh, others can comment, it's, the people I work with in Vancouver are 
dying, I mean, you know, they did a study, the Globe and Mail newspaper, they just ranked Indians as a nation in Canada back in 1999, and they were 58 in the world below Brazil and Thailand, just uh, right across the board, infant mortality, sickness, I mean, tuberculosis, the people I work with die from tuberculosis from all the crack pipes. Um, drug, I mean, AIDS is, is increasing quicker in the native community than any group in Canada. It's like all of those statistics. So it's like when all these Aboriginal women go missing and nothing's ever done about it, the attitude of the cops is literally, they're Indians, who cares? How can the Canadian people, as a so-called civilized society, how can they live with this act in place? It's the old question. How many people know about it? It's not taught in schools. You don't, you don't learn about it anymore. Uh, the minute you start talking in these terms, do you want to comment on that? Because I know yeah, you're I just want to say, I'm sorry, I've got to do something to make it. Basically, like, I, when I went to high school, you learn about, um, obviously, the history of Canada and stuff like that, and what they call social studies. Um, and you learn about the relation between uh, Europe and the came to Canada and the Aboriginal people. But it was, when they talk about the smallpox epidemic that broke out, it's almost, it's presented like that it was, you know, Accidental, obviously. Um, the Europeans brought the disease and then they were able to get it, obviously. So, of course, they died off. It's kind of been that way. And I had no idea until I spoke to Kevin earlier, and he was actually telling me about it. Um, in terms of why the Canadian people don't really, like, how you know, we can live with it, is the fact that, you know, as he was saying, um, if they move off the reserves, uh, they lose a lot of the government benefits that they're offered. Like, for example, um, Native youth, for example, are basically offered free university education if they can get to university and will pay for education. The fact of the matter is not that many Native youth go to university because they, they don't get in. They're raised, you know, there's a lot of drug use, alcoholism, and that kind of thing is happening on the reserves. And, you know, the government doesn't really um, make an effort to improve the, the sort of living social conditions on the reserves. They don't to get to university in the first place, that kind of thing. There's a lot of segregation, like using in his community, the same kind of thing all over um, BC. Uh, there was one native student at my high school, uh, when I was in school, and he only attended for one year when he left. Like, you just, there's just, they, they, they have, they kind of keep to themselves, but it's just that there's just, there's no integration. So if you don't really know native people, how are you really going to be? aware of these issues, you know what I mean? They have to struggle so much to really get their voices heard. Um, and often that's, you know, by them going to the media and doing protests and campaigning. But on, honestly, like the most experience I have with Native people personally is when they're on the streets um, trying to sell cartings or begging, that kind of thing. Like, they just don't really have that inspiration. Yep. How the residential schools were the kids forced to go there, mm. or was there a choice of families to... No, well, first of all, Indians were not citizens, so they didn't have the right to say no. Uh, between ni between uh, 1929 uh, and 53, it was against the law for a Native person to hire a lawyer, and you would be disbarred if you were a white lawyer and took on a Native client. Um, so, but nevertheless, they brought in a, a law in 1920, federal law, that made it mandatory for every native child over seven to be in one of these camps they call schools. Now if you didn't go, your parents would go to jail. But some of the people in the film here were hidden by their parents and moved around and the reason they're able to talk about this stuff now is they didn't go through that that uh, traumatization. Like the day you arrived at a residential school, you're lined up on the beach in the case of Port Alberni, your heads are all shaved, you have DD tower, TDT powder put on you, the boys and girls are separated, they're never allowed to speak. And that's Raphael Lemkin's key definition of a cultural genocide. You're destroying normal relations. So then in the long run, what's gonna happen, right? Dysfunctional, self-destructive families, okay? Mandatory rape of every child coming to the school. That was the, that was the norm. We found that out in lawsuits that happened. 